on singing with me I wanna rock with the dudes to fear is no excuse so Baby, tell me what you say Hey, hey, everybody, you are listening to 5 Minute Monday's Paving the Way podcast with your host, with the most, which I like to think, Medusa. M-A-D-U-S-A, made in the USA, baby. Wow. I am really looking forward to today's guest on so many levels because I am going to share a couple thoughts with him because I've worked with him. He is... um, a dry, energetic, awesome human being from Canada. (laughs) And I mean that with so much respect because this is the gentleman and I couldn't have done it without him. I couldn't have. He listened and poked and antagonized me. This is the other half of the great writing that actually put my thoughts into the best words possible to make my book, my biography, The Woman Who Would Be King, possible. His name is Greg Oliver. He is our guest today. He has written so many books uh, from wrestling to hockey and to other things that we're going to ask him questions about. Marcia and I have both done our due diligence. I know he has, but I've also dug a little deeper. So I'm going to ask him some questions. He probably wasn't expecting and I know he's probably sweating right now going oh my god Deborah (laughs) slay baby slay all day because we were speaking on the other end right before this interview and I did my five mile hike Greg did yoga I wonder if he can get his legs up behind him like this because his wife is amazing she does belly dancing and our producer Marsh, Marsh with the most. Here he is. Here he is. Marsh, Marsh. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. <laughs> Hi. He even started working out, everybody. Can we hear a big yay? Yeah. I mean, what did you work out? Jaw jacking or what? Oh, no. You already do that. I got a buddy who, uh, he's been a longtime friend of my old show. Uh, he started being my personal trainer. So we're just kind of like going <gasps> through uh, routines to kind of work on the right now, but I'm still getting sore. Just kind of realizing how much of the muscles you, you don't mean thinking about it. You You're still getting sore. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. But it's been cool. It's been good. Oh my gosh. I am so happy for you because here's the thing. There's, there's good and bad to working out again. When you say working out, are you working out with weights or are you doing full body weight? I mean, it's, it's going to be an augmentation wall. Right now, it's a lot of really low weight stuff as we're trying to figure out mobility and form and all of that. Mm-hmm. Maybe so. you might want to start with yoga and stretching, which is two powerful components that you would need to be working out because the more flexible you are, the least that you'll get hurt, pull a muscle, yeah. and feel better at the end of the day. That's a good call. It's a good call. It I do have a yoga app that I got like a year ago that I've only no used way. a couple times. Yeah, yeah. I did it a couple times and I was I was shocked when I did it because I did it for like the 10 minute thing to get mm-hmm. warmed up. Mm-hmm. And for two days, I was sore in places that I don't even remember stretching. I was like, what the, this is intense. I'm like, Right. And yeah. it's all about breathing too. Breathing yeah. is essential when you work out. So it's like in through the nose, out through the mouth, and it helps calm anxiety and stress. And I cannot stress enough how breathing is important. So are you a mouth breather at night when you sleep or do you breathe through yeah. your nose? Yeah, I'm a, I breathe through my mouth when I sleep. I wake up with such dry mouth, I have to keep water bottles by the bed. <laughs> I think sure. we all keep water by the side of the bed, but... Oh my gosh. Well, okay. I wish you the best on this journey. And don't forget that I am a yoga instructor. So maybe one of one of these days we'll have to do like a yoga thing on the podcast. Oh, that'll be good. That'll be it good. would. Especially as I start, like, I'll get back into it a little bit and I'll start going through the things and I'll have to start. I'll write down. You questions. and I will start doing our basic poses so people can watch you. Yeah. <laughs> Downward marsh. Downward marsh. <laughs> Speaking of downward, I think we should bring our guest in this week, Mr. Greg yes. Oliver. That's Look at this interesting oh. way to bring me in a downward spiral. Okay, I did, we did not say downward <laughs> spiral. That was Marsh thinking of himself. I don't know. Yeah. 
downward means downward marsh, downward yoga, downward dog. And I thought it was apropos to bring you in because you just got done saying you did yoga. Yeah, I've been going for, I don't know, three or four years. Um, really? At least, at least once or twice a week. No way. And it just, it helps do it. I don't do it at home. I, I do like cardio and all that stuff, but I have really bad knees. Had knee surgery about a, 10 years ago. So I do have to be a little bit careful about some of the stuff I do. Uh, but yoga works well. And this class today, you know, was gentle yoga, but it's still yoga. So it's, you ever it's do good. like hot yoga or? No, I've never done that. But we did. did uh, I really like the Ashtanga yoga we did for a while with um, the, the teacher was actually a kickboxer, a professional kickboxer. Hmm. So it was a really intense thing. But his, his courses don't match up with my lifestyle um, today <laughs> when I when I can do it. So. so a little self-defense to a little relaxation. That's that's pretty awesome. I, I can see the combination in your life. Yeah. Attacking, writing and then calming, yeah. breathing and yoga. That's perfect. And plus, you're going to need that extra workout because I know how you love your beer. Um, yeah, I'll have a beer or two, but I try to be good. It's generally on weekends. It's not like it's every day. And, and it's good, good Canadian beer. Of course, it has to be Canadian. So, okay, everybody, this is Mr. Greg Oliver, a very dear, great friend of mine. He was introduced to me from Mr. John Arezzi, and I love John. John and I go way back, um, and then we reconnected. We started having this thing called our morning coffee. Like, I would call him at 7 in the morning, whatever. We would talk about our days. And by the way, Marsh, I have called him like two, three times in the morning. He hasn't answered, just the FYI. And we have our morning coffee. And then during our conversations, I was like talking about expressing like maybe I should write a book. I do have a, a, a script put together, a manuscript I've already written. And then he said, you know, I just have my book written and Greg Oliver did it. And so and then he introduced me to Greg. Well, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> because the greatest man ever besides my husband and Marsh. Okay, Marsh, you too. Um, top actually put up with me for like a year, year and a half, speaking to me almost every day. Talk about emotional stress for this guy. And not just because, you know, of a woman complained. Because I, it's not like I, I complained much. And I'll let him air his to tell the <laughs> other side of the story, of course. But it was actually like peeling back an onion and, um, you know, telling my story and have to reliving it. So kudos to it's not about me or my book. It's about you, Greg. So kudos to you and our, you know, how we got together was uh, Mr. John Arezzi. And of course, a great publishing company. ECW Press has been actually really great to work with. And I highly, highly recommend if anyone's writing a book to see Greg and to use ECW Press. So that being said, Greg, um, you are a Canadian through and through. Yeah, I was born in Kitchener, which is about an hour from Toronto, but I've lived longer in Toronto than I ever did in Kitchener. And uh, oh. yeah, it's my home and uh, I'm certainly a proud Canadian, eh? Eh? <laughs> See, I understand what that means and what he's talking about, Marsh, because I'm from Minnesota and we're very close. So eh, you betcha, oofta, a lot of that translates into Canadian, eh? So, yeah, it's just it's an awesome slang. And as well as him, as Minnesotans, we're half frozen half the year. So that's why we look so good. <laughs> oh, preserved. We are preserved. Well <laughs> preserved. OK, Greg. Um, so you went to a, a university. You went to university for your bachelor's. Is that correct? Tell me what, what inspired you to be a writer. Or did you always know? Uh, I sort of always knew. Uh, like even really? when I was in high school. I, I can really distinctly remember, I think it was grade eight, We I wrote a novel with a friend um, based on the Secret Wars, the Marvel Secret Wars. And mm. uh, I can remember having the, the paper because it was the paper that was all attached together that came out of a dot matrix printer and the teacher just oh. pouring it out in front of the class to show everybody all the work. And so I think that was probably the key moment. But beyond that, I mean, I, I started my own wrestling newsletter when I was 14 um, and, and just did other stuff. I worked at the local newspaper um, a little bit. I, I ran the school newspaper. Uh, so all kinds of different things all just led me to know that I was going to be a writer. And I knew without any doubt, I'd get into the school I wanted. And I did. And, and yeah, I studied journalism for three years, but 
really where I learned a lot was I got a job at the Toronto Sun newspaper at how you know, old? Well, I was uh, at just in university, so twenty, my first year yeah, at 20. university, nineteen twenty, and uh, you know, all of a sudden you're thrown into life at a daily newspaper, and uh, you know, sure it was a summer job, but it I stuck around there for ten years, so oh, it, wow. uh, it worked out pretty well, and. I didn't do a ton of writing there, but I certainly learned the whole process, which has helped me immensely in my various careers over the over the years. I, I, I tell my son, who's 16, it's like almost every job I've ever gotten, I can point to some connection that happened through the Toronto Sun, people I met there. So wow. and, and even, even all the writing, it's the same thing, right? It's like this leads to this, this leads to that. If we hadn't connection. been doing the wrestling stuff, you know, ECW Press wouldn't have been in touch. So it all, it all just adds up. Connection. So your parents, were they writers as well? Oh, well, uh, let's define writers. Um, okay. Um, my, storytellers, my, uh, no, script. Okay. No, but my dad did do a book every year called The Buyer's Guide to Factory Outlets for Ontario. So this was a self-published book that he put out. And, uh, you know, so I learned early the value of traveling around and being able to stop in and visit a factory outlet in some small little town and then write off the whole trip. So my dad was an <laughs> trained as an accountant by by trade. And um, so we learned those kind of things. And we were all involved in that self-publishing process to a degree, whether it was stuffing envelopes or, you know, stuck on a trip going to visit a factory outlet and get the ad money or the ad placement. So those things were there. But, yeah, I wouldn't call my dad a writer. And my mom was definitely not a writer either. Um, but, you know, they, they were supportive for sure and everything I wanted to do. And my brother is a jock, so I also had that exposure. And I, I so I, I definitely got into the world of sports very early. But when I worked at the Sun for 10 years, I did very little sports, if anything, like really none. So it's kind of crazy that I've ended up with all these sports books and things later, years later. So was that was your first your first book that you wrote when you were in eighth grade, you said was what was the subject matter? It was it was basically about Marvel Comics. Marvel. And, OK. So, you know, we, we took creative license and, and didn't get special permission or anything. We just decided to write, so, which is what they wanted. Who does eight. at eighth grade? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't, I didn't even cross my mind for some reason. So, oh my gosh. I, and, and then fast forward to the Toronto press. Is that correct? Toronto um, Sun. Sun. You not only learned how that works on the back end and a little bit of writing, you've learned the knowledge of business. So you are fast tracking, you know, learning how you, and working with your father, learning how he did things on the road, you know, uh, learning about money, what to write off. So you were just seasoning yourself to what was coming to the future. hundred percent, because I also worked like my, my first three years were in the Toronto Sun Library. Um, so I learned how to organize things. I was always pretty well organized anyway with my old wrestling files. How dare you tease me about my OCD then? <laughs> Well, you know, but it, we're talking paperwork back then. And, and that's definitely your organizational skills are going through tub after tub and finding all that amazing Whatever. stuff was uh, a, a still a nightmare sometimes for me as a guy who did work in a library. It's like, there's so much here. We got to organize it. I don't have time. Anyways, mm -hmm. I'm covered in sweat. So, yeah, don't don't go to Florida in July and work outside uh, at uh, Medusa's house. Wait a minute. You were here last July? It was last July, wasn't it? So it's already been a year? Yeah. No. I think so. Yeah, it was God, pretty good. That seems like July. yesterday. Oh my yeah. gosh. Anyway, okay. So I want to know then you're at the Toronto Sun and you mentioned wrestling. How, how did you start writing for wrestling? Where, where did this come? How? Well, it was Hulkamania, it ran wild over me. So I did a wrestling newsletter <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, there was some hot chick on the AWA too. Who was it? It was Medusa. No, wait. What? Wendy Richter. Wait, no. Sherry Martell. No. Sherry Martell. No, she looked a little bit older than you did at that time for sure, right? And they put mm -hmm. her with they did she didn't wrestle a ton. They had they had her with Doug Summers and, and played yeah. with Buddy Rose. She was a great manager. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, so there was all that, but uh, yeah, you stood out so much at the time. And so that's what made this whole process rather surreal is teenage me's going, wait, Medusa's calling me? This is kind of bizarre. <laughs> oh Lord. No girls ever called me. <laughs> if I would have known that back then that I do now, I oh Lord. I wouldn't have I know I would have called. 
That, so that, okay, that's so life, isn't it? you, know, you so just all of a sudden too. said Hulkamania. I mean, I please get into that more because someone just doesn't write a Hulkamania newsletter. I mean, what you didn't like wrestling or you never watched it until one day. Exactly. It was it was Hulkamania. Everybody in the schoolyards talking about, you know, WWF, which was expanding at the time. And I never really paid attention to wrestling before that. And I missed out on some glory years of Maple Leaf wrestling uh, in and around Toronto, um, you know, where, you know, Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat and the Crockett's brought all the guys up here. And even before mm -hmm. that, you know, we had the Sheik was on top till about 77. So there was all kinds of great wrestling. I just knew nothing about it until about 1984 and 1985 when again hulkamania ran wild on me and but you quickly learned you didn't you know hulk hogan was great and all but man that what made the show go were guys like roddy piper and the the iron Sheik and all these things and and again my life ends up surreal because we start naming all those names there's really nobody i've never interacted with in some degree oh my gosh you never had the, you never had the opportunity to meet terry or randy no, no, that's what I mean. I've, I've, I've interviewed them all or, oh. or or somehow or at least, you know, within I've assigned somebody to write to talk to them, even if I didn't. Right. So I feel like I'm a, pro, a part of that. So, yeah, no, I've, I've met them all. I've, I've sat and drank beer with many of them or whatever it may that's be. Right? Cool. So. You would be a good one to interview and have someone write a book about you and your experiences. But my memories aren't very good. Like that's a, my memory Wait, is not great. It's really bizarre. eh? like I, I can be really great at writing other people's stories. But when I try to look back on my own life, I have trouble remembering stuff very specifically. Well, if I followed your yeah. techniques and what you did with me and you give me people and I, you know, somebody contacts all these people, it just re it, it just it triggers things to remind, to remember. And, and that's almost a regret that I didn't do that with the Resi's book. Like John's book's really good, um, but I really didn't work very hard at trying to talk to other people. And I did that with your book and with John Gibbons' book. And certainly the book, the first autobiography I did with was a goalie called Gilles Graton. Oh, he was they, crazy. They called him Gratuni the Looney. Yeah, no, he was quite nuts. But it was really great talking to him because Michael Holmes, our editor at ECW Press, suggested I go find a book um, by John Lydon from the Sex Pistols. And it was an autobiography, but it brought in other people's voices, which you don't hear a lot, right? You don't see right. that very often. So you'd be really reading the narrative, then there'd be a break and somebody else would tell a story. And it worked yeah. really great with Gilles Graton because everybody had these stories about this crazy goalie that they worked with. And that brought negativity into it, which you don't often mm -hmm. get in autobiographies too, right? Usually it's the negativity is you bashing other people. But in this case, the subject's being bashed. He yeah. was unreliable by I, the stories like, yeah. by, by the other people. And, and it takes a certain kind of person to agree to that. Rick uh, Flair and, would be a good one. I bet a lot of people have many stories on who, sir, Rick Flair. Rick, yeah. 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 Well, there's a new book coming out from ECW press by Tim Hornbaker. That's going to be a neutral kind of book, right? Cause Rick's done a book and a half, mm -hmm. I guess, if you call the second one, second nature, the one you wrote with Charlotte. Yeah. So he's done these books already. So this is going to be a little bit more impartial and, and it's going to be a biography on them, not an autobiography. And there's, the, there's a very big difference. Ooh, they're big difference. Um, okay. So when you went from the Toronto and, and in your writing and you found wrestling, how did it escalate and what was your next step to take it further? When I went away to, I left home and mm -hmm. I went to Toronto. I mean, it's like I said, it's about an hour away. So it's not like I, I picked up and moved across the country. But um, I purposely took a step back from the pro wrestling. I stopped doing my wrestling newsletter. I dropped a couple of my subscriptions. I'd occasionally go visit some friends and we'd watch um, the pay-per-views. At the time, Canada didn't have pay-per-view. So you had to go watch it in a, in a bar on a satellite. So that, that meant a collective of people together, right? And you'd go and hang out with them. I wasn't, it was a couple of years later when we got full pay-per-view um, in Canada. But I, I stepped away from wrestling. I didn't do anything. Uh, I purposely uh, didn't write about it. And that turned out to be really smart because it was a bit of a downtime of that industry, the early 90s. And it wasn't again until wrestling took off again that uh, it coincided with the Internet. And I was a part of the day one people that started the Toronto Suns website mm. It's called Canoe. And we put the Slam Wrestling website on there. Uh, and I just happened to John Powell was one of the guys there. And we started talking. We both liked wrestling. And the various Sun newspapers across Canada had wrestling content. We had Bret Hart's column in Calgary. 
we had uh, later we had Cyrus Don Callis's column in Winnipeg. We had a, a column in Ottawa. We had a column in Toronto, and they did interviews. And like at one point, the greatest selling Toronto Sun newspaper ever was WrestleMania six. The day afterwards, oh, wow. So they they recognize that their market because it's a tabloid newspaper, right? It's not all hoity toity like reading the New York Times. Mm-hmm. It's it's definitely a bit more of a down market paper and wrestling sold so it wasn't a big deal for us to really build our wrestling website and start interviewing people and because we had the newspaper behind us we therefore had some connections to get those interviews and wwf worked with us right from the start all those kind of things so when you worked there you started slam wrestling yeah so basically what year was that the the 1996 late 1996 oh it was 96 yeah so 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 that was birthed or 96 around and then you've it's it's still to d- today. Yeah, Slime Wrestling still one of the wow. best news sites out there. Um, it's a little different than it used to be. Things change, uh, and that's that's okay. Um, but through the, the years, I don't think there's anybody else there doing true wrestling journalism, which is what we've been doing. There's a lot of people that We're call, missing them, journalism in call themselves journalists, but you know, when all you're doing is reporting that this guy farted in a tweet, it's like, is that real journalism? So I, I don't know. It's, it's a bit... Um, it's a bit weird out there. They're they're my colleagues, and yet it's it's tough sometimes to look at it and go, "This isn't really wrestling journalism." That's one thing I learned about working with you. When you when you see something, you call it, and it's not, and you're doing it in a way where it's not a dig. It's just a, it's a matter of fact. Like that's ex- you know exactly what's happening in life. You give your point of view, and it just it makes sense on so many things. I hate that I have to agree with you. But. Oh, that that must hurt. But yeah, it, it, it's it really that does. idea. But it's also a way to better themselves, right? And yeah. if somebody that's out there hears this and says, "Well, I'm a wrestling journalist," and it's like, "Okay, well, do you have a degree? Do you follow things up? Do you check the facts? You know, all these kind of things. What's more important to you, getting this story right, or getting it out there right away and getting the do hits?" Do you, you do you believe in um, headline clickbaits? No, I hate it. But you recognize why people do it. But when you look at our website, you don't see that. In the sense, sure, there's going to be some of that, right? But if the subject is about somebody, I'm not going to put wrestler, you know, dies in plane crash. I'm going to write the guy's name in the headline, right? Otherwise, it is clickbait. And Uh, that's just, you know, that's just poor journalism. I think so, too. It's very cheap and it's belittling. And I don't think it's it's discrediting, I think. I don't know. What am I? I'm not a journal. I, I just... I know what I like. I like I like to read something and actually feel like I'm taking away something and I I was educated by it. Something yeah, and we quickly and... gained a good reputation. It really helped. I mean, Bret Hart was a huge part of this because uh, his columns immediately had a following. Wait and... a minute. You got heat with Bret Hart, though. No, I don't. I've always I've never had a problem with Bret. <laughs> Bret had a problem with me. There's a fundamental. That's difference, what it is. Then let me turn that around. OK, so you're both <laughs> Canadian. And you ranked, let me get this straight. You ranked Bret Hart like number 12 or 15 or something. 14. And 14? Mm-hmm. 14. Okay, excuse me. <laughs> and he didn't like it. What happened? What were you doing? What were you thinking, Greg? The truth? <laughs> well, okay, of course, it's one man's opinion, right? Yes, only Let's your that. opinion. This is from the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, the Canadians, which came out in 2003. And it's not meant as a defense, but if I wrote the book today, 20 years later, it would be a different book. Part mm-hmm. of the rule was that if you had an active career, you weren't going to be in the ranked in the top 20. Oh. Right. So at the time, you know, Edge and Christian and Chris Benoit and all these guys were out there and great performers. Right. Brett's yeah. career by that point was basically over. He had the injury already. Uh, mm-hmm. So wasn't going to be going that much further along in the wrestling career. So he got in there. Um but yeah, no, I ranked him 14th. Now, there's so many great wrestlers from Canada that people don't talk about. I love telling this story. Okay, did you ever meet? Oh, I know you met Gene Kaniski because. Oh, gee. Let me, okay, we don't have to. Yes, I did meet Gene there. Okay. Anyways, not all those stories are in the book, but uh, she dated <laughs> him for a bit. So she's been, I, there were some cute pictures we never used of like her sitting on, on Gene Kaniski's lap. And <laughs> Gene was the best. Shut was, up, Marsh. He was so loud. He was so opinionated. He oh. was just so colorful. He was just so old school, right? It just, it's yes. like that don't exist anymore. And 
he was the dad who took care of his kids when his wife oh, he did he and did so i mean think about an anachronism in the 70s a guy doing that and running a business and wrestling so gene could do no wrong in my book anyways so, <laughs> but here i was i'm on the phone with him i go gene i'm ranking you the sixth greatest canadian of all time in the book and he started getting all riled up it's like all right you know yes you probably picture his voice and i said can i tell you who's in front of you and he goes okay and i said well whipper billy watson yvonne oh. Robert, killer kowalski mad dog vachon and earl mccready Ooh. and then there's a bit sort of silence on the other end he goes i'm okay with that so oh wow so there's once he heard who it was you're, you're and in wrestling, you're supposed to have a really good opinion of yourself, right? Otherwise, you're not going to succeed. If you think you suck, nobody's going to book you, right? So I understand everybody having an ego, but there's also a way the world works, right? That everybody builds on everybody else. Whipper Billy Watson was the equivalent to Gorgeous George in Canada, which defines U.S.-Canada relations to a T, right? Here you are with a advent of tv gorgeous george is a huge star right in the late 40s early 50s as everybody starts getting a tv right they gather around a local shop just to watch wrestling because it was a yeah. one camera shot so you could stay and watch the wrestling in canada we didn't have a showboat that goes out there with the you know purifier for clear the air with a valet no we had a superhero called whipper billy watson who preached you know had a safety club who uh, you know had a sold dumbbells and and had his own pop named after him. He was <laughs> the epitome of a good guy. So to me, that explains the U.S. Canada the way it developed from there. They had been a TV. Group. So Whipper Billy, there's nobody that came close as far as impact on Canada. Everybody in the country knew who he was, and as big a star as Bret Hart would have been. Yes, that was never the case. Hmm. So okay. So when you here's my thing. So. You run basically in the CEO of Slam Wrestling. It's a partnership, but yes, I, I understand why people see that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was being nice and polite because when you speak of it, you it comes across that way. So I just wanted to clear it with everyone. So it's a partnership with everyone yeah, there's equally. Two, there's two other guys, John John Powell and, and Bob Kapoor, that are my partners on it. But for okay. sure, it's been my blood, sweat, and tears um, continually since. 1996 it doesn't please mean don't give up because it is amazing and and i do want to say this everybody get if you don't if you haven't please look it up slam wrestling is it slam wrestling inc slam wrestling.net yeah dot net and um i didn't know if there was the ink in there i couldn't remember but i mean I, he has very i mean he has a very tough job like a, a lot of the obituaries like i'll be talking to greg one day on the phone he goes i gotta go someone just passed away and i'll be like what how do you know this stuff and that's yeah. got to be the hardest part of the job. And when I see what he writes, it's just like, gosh, you know, can I talk to you about my obituary? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I, get, I finally get the the unedited uh, manuscript, right, where we can publish everything when you're gone. So that's going to be. A oh, whole no, it's going to be locked in my safe, really. Well, yeah. I, I know this, the combo. Isn't that the whole point of me going there was to learn <laughs> well, all that's... that? <laughs> You're so much. Oh my God. But, but anyway, the obituary <laughs> story are, are a big yes. part of our site. And it's imp as important to me to recognize, you know, the guy who was on the undercard or the referee or the historian when they pass, as it is the big star like the Iron Sheik there uh, uh, two weeks ago. Um, they, they all contribute to the wrestling business. They, and to be honest, some of the lesser known people do way better traffic. So not, not that's the reason to do it. It just, it's important to me to try to recognize everybody. But of course you can't, like we're still, you know, a couple of people putting out a website. It's not like we have some big, you know, huge, humongous, colossus company behind us running it all. Um, I want to get back to what your forte is, and that is your writing in your books. When you first wrote your first book and had it published and made your first dollar, what book was that? That was the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, the Canadians in 2003. It was, mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty magical just because, and, and any author with more than one book will say this, there's nothing like your first book yep. because everybody comes out to support you, right? So we had a book launch. At well, Golden. some people. Well, also don't launch during a pandemic and all those kind of things too. But um, 
yeah, it, it, it can be rather odd sometimes. But the first book, people support you. They come out. You have these magical experiences. And it didn't happen like that again until I did the hockey book called Don't Call Me Goon, which I think was the seventh book I did. So, But that brought out a whole different crew of people, right? They may not have been interested in the wrestling. They were interested in hockey. So they came out and supported that. And I made So your whole... first six books was about? Wrestling. Wrestling. And then your very first book out of wrestling was the hockey play. Wow. It okay. was about the fighters. So it was a small step. The gooners, yeah. The goons, yeah. Yeah, Zemlock, remember? <laughs> yeah, well... Yeah, you, you like to brag about him, too. Yeah, so she no, dated no, a hockey no. guy. He's not really in the book. One of those other things we took out. Okay, whatever. Minnesota Next. North Stars. Okay, all right. So, okay, your first book then on hockey. And then after that, you branched out a little bit more. Tell me how you chose. Did you feel like you needed new energy? Did you want to expand? Did you want to test yourself? Did you feel like once you branched out into something different than sports... Did, was there a sense of, I, of course I need to do my best because I need to make this person look great, but the, tell me the steps that you go through as far as like the, that first failure feeling and writing your first book out of sports. Well, there's a lot to that question. Well, the, the fact is I never just wrote about sports, right? So I'm at the Toronto Sun. I, I would, you know, get an assignment to interview you know, somebody talk who, about your published book first. I know, I know, but this, this all leads hockey. into that in the sense okay. that I always had other interests, right? So, like, I, I may talk to somebody who runs a radio station or had a, a clothing shop, or this this guy Joe DiMaggio Jr. that had a restaurant, oh, yeah. and so all these different people I got to interview help build on your skill set, right? And it was great at at the canoe website in the entertainment section because I could follow some other dreams. So I got to talk to uh, Ralph Bakshi, who owned the rights to Lord of the Rings, and Saul Zantz, who uh, owned actually owned the rights and licensed it. But he's the guy that John Fogarty wrote Zantz Can't Dance about. So like all these different oh. things all add up to where I get to the point where I'm doing the wrestling. I have confidence in my ability to write about other things. I go to Michael Holmes. I say, well, what's next? And we come up with Don't Call Me Goon. And then the hockey stuff just took off from there. And you're talking to these old hockey players. And so my confidence grew to the point where there was two things going on. I had my, my son was born in 2006 and I was the stay at home dad. So my actual work changed a bit. Right. Like my main job was looking after him. And then when he got a little bit bigger, I was able to do some other things. So I was able to write about other things that interested me, which led to a book about Billy Van, who was an entertainer. And this one we self-published and we shopped it around a bit and we probably could have gotten a publishing deal. But in the end, we just did it ourselves. It was in the depth of the pandemic. But the idea was that this was somebody that was important to me in the 70s that I watched on TV. He was on Sonny and Cher. He was on a show called Player's House of Frightenstein. Uh, he just did so much. But I worked with a guy named Stacy Case and the cooperation of the family. And we did this amazing book called Who's the Man, Billy Van? Uh, oh, all yeah. about his life, a real biography. It was so much fun. And so, yeah, my skill set had gotten to that point and my confidence. And that's a big part of what writing is anyway, is is you got to believe in yourself uh, and good grammar helps and, and that, that skill set. But that doesn't happen right away. Uh, and, and the other aspect, too, is that I worked at a publisher for three or four years called Sport Classic Books. So at the same time I was being published, we were starting a publishing company. So I also learned about editing and, and photo rights and, uh, you know, the joys of editing and working. You with are very well versed. I mean, you know, when just I, I didn't mean to cut in, but I know when I was writing with you that. I mean, you knew every intricate thing like, you know, this wouldn't look good. This picture doesn't go well or the editing. You got to think about editing. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't even know what you're talking about. But yeah, it is very I have, important. I have, a, I have a really weird, weird skill set that way, don't I? And that, and that is good. rare. Like when I'm sending in the list of photos, you know, it's in a nice spreadsheet that, you mm -hmm. know, they can immediately lay out because that could be me doing the layout. So I, I really enjoy that aspect of things, too. And the editing process, which is. One of my joys at Slam is 
working with young writers, right? It might be an intern coming to me from one of the local universities or colleges that are studying journalism. It might be some guy who's not a trained journalist, but loves wrestling. So I work with him and get him better at doing his, you know, writing about pro wrestling. Wow. Uh, you still have the passion. You still I, love for it. writing for words. Yeah. For writing and words. And, and I'm not sure I have a passion for pro wrestling per se. I don't watch a lot of it. Right. But I still love collecting stories. I still love talking to the old wrestlers, especially. Um, yeah, there's, there's that aspect. And I love it when my guys get to do things they want to do, right? Interview people, go to shows. We have Forbidden Door in Toronto uh, coming up this weekend, the big AEW show. And there's interviews that we're doing and going to, one guy going to a press conference and a photographer getting in there. So there's all oh. those things going on all at the same time. Gosh, yeah. Amazing. I, I think I like you a little bit more. <laughs> How could you? Oh, no. <laughs> oh my God. Mm -hmm. Oh, geez. Oh, God. All right, everybody. Peace out. Thank you for tuning in. Until next week, part two. Thank Call you. me Queen of Carnage. I will beat your ass. This is my time. Busting doors, breaking glass ceilings. And I like to play. They used to call me a lunder blade, but not anymore. I am Medusa and always will be Medusa. And that's what I think of the woman's championship belt. Oh, hey.